I'm now going to invite uh, all the presenters to please come up. Um, there is some crazy button you can hit that makes this a black screen. I don't know what it is, so I'll try to deal with that in a moment. Um, I'm going to open the floor to questions, uh, but I did want to remind you of a couple of things as you're thinking about questions to ask. One is that there's a, a, a proposal for an SEI initiative on inclusive energy transition. So do these presentations give some evidence that that will be a compelling and useful frame? And then uh, also that some projects specifically ask for advice because they're in the planning stages. Um, but please, yes, we have one here. Oh, we need to record. Oh. Cheers. <laughs> Hi, Michael Lazarus. Um, th thank you, thank you, Oliver, for spending time with the question of inclusiveness. That's um, it's sort of the mystery I word here. Um, how does it work? And I, I want to be slightly provocative and ask the question: uh, it, can, can, Is it possible to be too inclusive too soon? And I asked that question in reference to your example of PVMTI versus the IFC project. You have a PV technology which isn't quite mature. Delivery mechanisms aren't quite well developed. Costs are very high. Um, and with all these projects we've heard about, I guess it's a question for everybody on the panel if they want to chime in on. Uh, g given that a lot of folks we work with could, can become rather donor and intervention weary at times, um, is there a point in sort of the innovation de and development of an idea or a technology where one should be more or less inclusive? Thank you. You got that? Because I'm going to get a few more questions. Yes, actually, Michael, right next to you. Here. Um, Pat Clevenus here. Uh, following on from that question to you as well, Oliver. Um, Another sort of lens on, on the inclusiveness, a very different lens that you get from sort of practitioners in the field trying to build solar home business, businesses is, is the issue of business models. And so some would say that the reason that the, uh, the first program failed and the second one succeeded was that one had a business model that worked, the other one didn't. I just want to inject it as a very different perspective on potentially the same issue and see if we can widen the discussion of inclusion, inclusiveness to include this set of stakeholders as well, because I think that would strengthen um, our thinking about it. Um, I think the next question is on the far side. You'll get your exercise. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And then after three questions, we'll answer those and then keep going. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to ask another question. Um, a general question aimed at the panel as a whole, and that is, we're talking about transformational change here. So what theory or theories of change are you using to give a model against which you can do your, your research? And to what extent are you thinking about um, critical assumptions in change and ways of testing some of those assumptions, because it's not all going to be rosy. And I think understanding some of the unintended consequences could be very important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so can I ask the presenters, Oliver, you got a couple of questions. So maybe you start, and then uh, for the last question, uh, I'll see who wants to respond. OK, thank you uh, for those lovely questions. <laughs> Michael, um, can you be too inclusive too soon? I, I think this for, for me is a, is a really important question and may be the sort of next step in the, this kind of research agenda. Um, I think it, it may be that it, when you're thinking about um, certain types of, of, of change or certain types of innovation, technology diffusion, might be on a kind of national grid scale, then you, you might not have to be so inclusive in certain ways as you would with, with others uh, in, in, in some of the, the decision making. Um, but yeah, it's difficult to, difficult to, to answer because this, this case is very much about household energy and this really needs to be, you really need to, to explore at sort of local users, consumers of the technology, their needs. You do need to be inclusive in that sense. Um, and I guess if we broaden this out, uh, then 
that we may find that um, you want to be inclusive in certain ways at certain times. But, so a bit of a, a poor answer in a way, but this is, I guess, because this is a, a very initial uh, sort of research project. Indeed, the, the, the PV case uh, comes from um, my, my, co my friend and colleague uh, Rob Byrne, who's done a very much, a, a, for many years, a history of innovation of PV in Kenya. So we're kind of taking that, that, uh, that field research and, and his analysis and using it to explore this, this particular uh, issue. But moving forward, uh, we, we need to think more strategically about what cases we might actually explore and how we might, might uh, go in a bit more deeply. Uh, per, um, excuse me. Per, uh, thanks very much for your point. I think that's a, it's, it's interesting to... The idea of business models is a very... Uh, it's a bit of a buzzword. Uh, as is inclusiveness, indeed, um, and I think thinking about that uh, that approach could be useful, especially in in sort of bringing that to the the private sector community, um, and uh, so I take that on board as well. Thank you very much. Um, and then, does anyone want to address the question of, yes. please? Yeah. Uh, I would like to uh, address the question of inclusiveness. Is there a time when it can be too early? Uh, with another question, is uh, when would that time would be? When would a time be that inclusiveness is not in uh, interesting? I, I cannot think of one time when it's not, you know, worth having inclusiveness. I cannot think of it. Uh, inclusiveness is a process. And so as all processes, it, this takes time. And unless you, you actually understand that and understand that things will take time, even if you launch an idea, if you go to a meeting and launch an idea in the meeting, you can actually kill a good idea by immediate reactions. You need to do consultations before. You need to inform. You need to build a, a momentum for it. So you, there are different ways of including at different stages in the process. But there is no process, no, no point in the, in the world we live today. Uh, there is, I, I cannot see a time when inclusiveness is, is not uh, an issue. Uh, and I see when, when looking in Indonesia, uh, where actually the, the policymakers at national level are extremely aware of the need to actually really anchor the decisions they make at national level, at the regional level, because they know it will not work unless they do that. And you should do that. At, of course, the, the projects have different connotations. If you look at, we, we have seen the, the example from Africa here. They, they come and they take land very quickly because we want to do large plantations of palm oil, or whatever. Uh, and, and one of the, sometimes people put, I have been in many presentations where people put as a problem that people have very small properties in Africa. But give me a break, Europe is full of small properties. The, the average of a farm in Italy is seven hectares. You know, the, it, this is, has not been a problem for actually developing a sector in Europe. It's not so different as we think. It's just a question that if you have, it's, this is the structure you have. If you start from that structure, and that's what we are trying to do in, in the Indonesia project, we start from what is there, the, 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 the way the, the sugar plantations are organized, the way that the people are thinking of how to organize the renewable energy technologies and, and the renewable energy policies for the country, the way it is, and then we build from there because this is already anchored. This is already inclusive. That's how they are thinking. I heard the words today from, uh, uh, from Sida saying that you have to understand where people are, what they actually, what their problems, how they frame their problems. If you understand how they frame their problems, then you can go and talk to them from the perspective. And that's inclusiveness. Um, regarding the last question that was asked, <laughs> it's awesome applause for you. Um, regarding the last question that was asked, um, does anyone want to talk about how you're conceptualizing change? So what's your theory of change? Yeah, well, maybe I should uh, answer that from a, my perspective. Um, I'm, the way I've kind of framed it is coming from the socio-technical transitions approach. So this is how um, kind of, I don't want to go too much in depth, but in terms of how, how you kind of have 
um, technologies and how society is um, kind of arranged around those certain technological and, and societal kind of uh, configurations and how you think about how new technologies then come into being, how there's kind of innovation processes that support certain pathways and not others. And also, the, um, you mentioned kind of the unintended consequences of that, of course, is the danger of lock-in to specific pathways at the expense of others. And that's uh, something that there, there are people working on looking at, well, if we choose these certain pathways, support these certain technologies, is that the right way to go? How do we maintain kind of diversity? How do we open up and not just lock down um, uh, certain, certain uh, sort of socio-technical configurations. So that's the, the kind of theoretical perspective I'm coming from. And then asking within that, then, how do you give a voice to the, 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 the marginalized in society? Because typically, if, they, if, you, if you don't give them a voice, the, the pathways will, that uh, we will move along will be dominated by those who have a voice, those who are um, more influential, who's often the vested interests. Uh, so. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else want to address that question before we open it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I think there's, it's very important to, to uh, understand that there have to be champions in, 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 um, in, in, uh, in the change, in the process of change. And uh, unless, and, and these can be the same ones that might be apparently the losers in the process, if you actually understand in which ways you can trigger uh, them, uh, the possibility for them being winners. Um, uh, my, my favorite example is ethanol in Sweden, uh, where there, ha there was a lot of support for, um, uh, for the ethanol development, and yet uh, it came to a dead end. Uh, I, I still think, think it can be survived, but can survive, but it would depend on a number of things. But one of the main issues is that there was no, co no industry that was really a winner in that uh, game. Uh, we see a different situation today in the biogas because suddenly there has been a, a joint interest uh, on the gas side and uh, there are people, see, uh, industries, that saw the opportunity of winning. So understanding how actually people can be champions and winners in the process of change I think is very important to actually gather that inclusiveness that is necessary. And then we, in the context of poverty, we talk very much about inclusiveness of the poor, but uh, I mean, inclusiveness also of the entrepreneurials in that context is an, an extremely important because they are the champions that can actually push. They are the winners in that context. And you have to actually identify those potential winners. OK. Um. I was going to take more questions. Oh, and Charlie's got his hand up. Um, the, and Roger's got his hand up. And I'm not sure who that is, but there's another hand. It's actually time for the coffee break, but I, I really like to, can, can we get short responses to these? So we'll do Charlie, Roger, uh, unidentified. <laughs> OK. I'll try and keep this brief. I'm so I, I just wanted to react to what you were saying, Samida, about can there ever be a case for not having inclusive energy transition? And I think that maybe there's a slight sort of um, people are talking at cross purposes slightly. And I, I, I think that we would all agree that inclusive development is absolute necessity. But I think maybe slightly the issue we're, that I'm confronting here is, do I like the overall term inclusive energy transition? So I think where you might say, is it too soon, might be the question of, you know, are we asking the poorest members of society to take on the burden of experimenting with new technologies that are not uh, economic in the rich world yet? And I think that maybe that's maybe what Michael was also hinting at. So I think... Yes, you want, you want to have inclusiveness in development, but is that the same thing as wanting inclusive energy transitions? So if, if, you know, when most people talk about energy transitions, they're talking about you know, how, we, how do we transition to societies using very different energy technologies, you know, whether it's nukes or wind or solar. And, and so, so maybe it's just kind of a question of putting the two terms together is, is causing us some problems. 
Sorry, that was a bit long. Thank you. Okay, yeah. So then around uh, to Roger. Um, yeah. And I, uh, I, I think the we only have time for you to give frowny faces or smiley faces. To, okay. <laughs> okay, Roger Kasperson, Clark University in the United States. Um, this is actually, this may be in tune with, with what our chair is looking for because it's a question that I would like to table uh, and take up again at the end of the two days rather than immediately. And the, the question is, I sat here through the first session this morning listening to how solution-oriented research is so important mm -hmm. for SEI. And I've heard a whole range of different kinds of efforts going on. And I'm sitting here wondering, has anybody done a report card on how this looks in terms of solution achieving kinds of uh, work? And uh, whatever that report card has to say, can we take that component of, of uh, what is needed to get to a higher level of, and convert that into a broad general analysis that SEI ought to be working on in the next several years? Thank you. And then we have one more question at the back. Um, and I'll just say quickly as the microphone's going up that I, I think we've made some strides in monitoring and evaluation and reflecting on what we're doing, but we got a long way to go. But I think we've definitely improved on that. <clears throat> Matthias Goldman from Think Tank Forest. People tell me you should shut up because it's coffee time. So, <laughs> so, so my question is just very simple and it's, it's basically directed to Caroline. I was excited to hear that you might get more poverty alleviation when making biofuels from crops rather than making cooking oil or other stuff. So I was just excited to hear some of the main reasons for that. Thank you. Yes, so we, some of these are hypotheses we are testing, so we still don't know, but we have, what we are going to compare is, for instance, where biofuel is produced, targeting local energy as a form of energy for cooking for local households. Does it lead to better poverty alleviation impacts compared to where the households engage in biofuel production for the transport sector? So where they get direct benefit versus indirect. So we don't have the outcome yet. So at the moment we are testing. There's the question on solution or Oh, no, we can't do that. OK, so thank you very much. Let's thank the, the panel. And I'm sorry to hold you one more second. Wednesday, 11 to 12.30, there will be a meeting on this topic discussing it as a possible new initiative. No room yet, but keep posted. Okay, thanks.